Keys for supernatural increase. Keys for supernatural increase. Let me uh, preface everything I'm about to say today by this one fact, this one golden nugget. And if you can get one thing out of this broadcast, this would be it. And that is God requires and desires for you to increase and multiply. I want to start out by reading Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to read uh, from verse 1. And then we're going to skip some verses and skip over to verse 26. But listen to this. Verse 1. Chapter 1 verse 1. The very first verse in the Bible. This is what the Bible says. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament. And skip to verse 8. God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens uh, be gathered together into one place. Let's skip to verse 11. God said, let the earth bring forth f grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And he, the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let the lights in the firmament of the heavens um, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament and the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the one to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night. He made the stars also. Then you skip over the verse uh Verse 21, and God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and evening uh, and even and sorry and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good and he said be fruitful multiply fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply and so the evening and the morning were the fourth day and the earth brought forth living creatures according to its kind cattle creeping things every beast of the earth which was according to its kind and now let's skip to verse 26 and this is where I'm getting it verse 26 and God then said let us which shows that there's a divine trinity because it's not the it's not um, Elohim in the singular form. It's Elohim in the pluralistic form, which shows that God is three in one, which proves the trinity. And I'm not going to get into that, but there, I, maybe I'll do a video uh, in the near future describing that and all the proof from the scripture. But let us, that's why a lot of people are confused. Why does it say let us if God is one? Well, let us. God is one, but it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one. People have a hard time understanding that. It's really not that hard. There are three distinct persons, and they have one united agenda, one united purpose, one united heart. They're perfect in harmony. There's never disagreements. Let us make man in our own image, according to our own likeness. Let them have dominion. So what does he say? I'm going to make humans. I'm going to make man. I'm going to make Adam. And this is the purpose, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So everything we just read up until verse 26, all the things God created, God then creates man and says, let's make him to rule over it all, to have dominion over all over everything I just created. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now verse 28, pay special attention to this. Then God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. I want you to write that in the comment section. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I read all that to say this. When God created light, he created it and then exclaimed, you were made 
with a purpose, and that is to give light on the earth. He created the fish, and he said, your purpose is to swim in the seas, in the ocean, in the rivers. He created the vegetation, the fruits, the trees of the field, and he said, your purpose, he exclaimed, your purpose is to feed all that I've created, every living thing, beast and human. He created the birds and he said, your purpose is to fly in the, in the air. Your purpose is to fly in the air, the fowl of the air. The Bible often, oftentimes describes birds as. Your purpose is to fly. He created the fish to swim. He created the bird to fly. And then he lands on man and he says, man, I'm creating you. And he, if you read Genesis 2, he actually forms man out of the dust. He doesn't just speak man into existence. He forms man out of the dust. And then he boldly exclaims, your purpose, we read it in verse 28, is to be fruitful and to multiply. Just as a bird's calling is to fly and a fish's calling is to swim, your calling as a man or a woman created in the image of God is to be fruitful and to multiply. It is not something that is for the uh, select few that are in the higher levels of God's hierarchy. God doesn't have a hierarchy. The Bible says that he receives anyone that comes to him if you'll come in faith and in hunger and desperation for what he has. And so this calling to be fruitful and multiply in the vision that God's placed in your heart is for everyone. You were not created with, as an accident. You weren't an afterthought. You weren't something that God got bored with and said, you know what, let me just uh, draw this guy up. You were made with a purpose. The Bible says before you were even born, God called you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God said, I knew you and I wired you with a specific purpose and destiny. And when God calls a person to fulfill fulfill something he doesn't call you to penury he doesn't call you to mediocrity he doesn't call you i mean this is something that religion has pumped into far too many christians they always say these stupid things like it's not important to be fruitful it's just important that you're faithful let me tell you something you can be faithful at the wrong thing and be fruitless in it and you're still being faithful but it's to the wrong thing not everyone that is faithful will be fruitful because it's what you're faithful to that will determine your fruitfulness in life. But when you're faithful to God's vision and what God's called you to do and to the path that he's laid out for you, it is impossible. Let me repeat that. If you're faithful to God's vision, it is impossible to not enter into supernatural increase and fruitfulness in that area. In that area. You can go out and do your own thing. There's a way that seems right unto men and its end is the way of death. Its end is the way of frustration. Its end is the way of stagnation. But if you'll, the Bible says, in the way of the Lord is strength for the upright. The Bible says in the way of righteousness is life, is riches, and is honor. So when you follow, this might be the first time you've ever heard this. You were probably, many people are taught that uh, poverty is piety and to struggle in life is a sign of godliness and 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 as long as you know it doesn't matter if you ever if you ever have any results in life as long as you're just keeping to that path that's that, that's what matters when you follow the path of god results are going to follow that's what Jesus was saying. I mean, that's what Moses was saying in Deuteronomy 28. He said, if you will diligently hearken unto my voice, if you'll keep to what I'm telling you today, it, all these blessings will come on you. All these blessings will come on you. Blessed will you be in the field. Blessed will you be in the country. Blessed will you be in the city. And the Bible says, that uh, God will bless your, your needing bowl. God will bless your storehouses with grain. Even your enemy that rises up against you, they'll be defeated before your face while you continue to increase. You look at anybody God called in scripture. I mean, you look at David. Was David called? And then everything just went southward ever since he was, no, David got called, David was anointed, and it led to supernatural increase. It led for, I mean, he became a national treasure in his day. Moses was called, he was a, 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 a convict, he was on the run. 
He was, he was on the run. He was fleeing the Egyptian government when God called him. And when he called him, God made him into something. Everybody is somebody to Jesus. And if the devil's lied to you, and I know there's all kinds of religious people that are going to come on this and say, oh, he preaches this, he preaches that. He tells people that if you'll just follow God, God will just, you know, God will bless you. I ain't telling you anything that I came up with. It's what the Bible, it's what the Bible says. It's what the scripture says. And you'll get religious flies flies love they love to come in on food that you're trying to eat you got to swat the flies out ignore the haters and focus on what the scripture says because let me tell you religion and religious people will work hard to try and strip the bible of its reward they try and strip the bible of 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 its blessing you know paul warned the church at colossae when he said don't let anybody cheat you out of your reward don't let anybody cheat you out of what God by the blood of Jesus Christ purchased for you don't let religiously brainwashed people uh, discouraging discourage you from reaching out for God's best because let me tell you because God is for you it doesn't matter who's against you. Because God is for your increase, it doesn't matter who's against you. It doesn't matter if the devil's against you. It doesn't matter if the religious system's against you. If God's hand is for you, there's only one place that you're going to move, and that is forward and upward with God. That's what Proverbs 4.18 says. The path of the just shines brighter and brighter even unto that perfect day. And there's a lot of people... No, I tried all that, didn't work for me. So that's all just misinterpretation of the Bible. That's just the scripture taken out of context. That's just this, that's just the. And really it's because I didn't get it. You'll never have it and you can't have it. And anyone that tells you you can't have it, they're false prophets, false teachers, deceivers of the brethren, and that's it. Really? Because you didn't have it, God must not, God must not uh, offer it? What a prideful stance to have. Because I didn't taste of it, it must not exist. That's like me saying, because I've never had a steak, steak must not be real. Because I've never ate at a restaurant, restaurants are just fairy tale locations that Disney invented once upon a time in a in a happily so uh, happy uh, uh, happy for what is it? Um, they lived ha happily forever, whatever, whatever the, the, I'm skipping my mind right now. I don't watch much Disney. But, you know, just because somebody didn't partake of it, then it must not exist. Well, if that's the case, there's people that come to church, get saved, backslide, totally apostatize, turn away from the faith. Are we going to say, well, I guess salvation must not be, salvation must not be for us, brothers. I guess salvation must not be a, uh, a, a real thing. You know, I know the Bible says you can have it, but look, I know brother so-and-so, he believed God for salvation. He backslid. You know, that's how people think. That's how, pe that's how some people who the devil, they've successfully allowed the devil to discourage them to the point where they've become hopeless and helpless and, beyond, and they've given up. And because they've become help hopeless, they're beyond help. You have to have hope. You have to have hope. So I started all that to say, God created you for increase. Now understand this, increase is not just something that God, you know, would love for you to have. It's not just something that he, uh, he wishes you can walk in. Luke chapter 13, let's read this. This is a parable Jesus spoke. He also spoke this parable saying, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking, what did he come seeking? Fruit on it. He came looking for fruit. He came to look for results. Fruit is results. He came to look for a tangible result. What has this fruit been bearing? Ha this tree been bearing? Has this tree produced anything for me? And he found nothing. And he looked to the keeper of the vineyard and said, Hey, listen. Even though, even though there's, uh, even though there's, 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 no fruit on this tree. God didn't call us to bear fruit. He called us just to abide. And when you abide, that's all that matters. That's not what the keeper said. The keeper, who's a representation of God, said, hey, listen, for three years, I've come looking for fruit. Do you know what that tells you? God takes roll call. God takes rounds on what he's created. You know, Jesus said, 
to whom much is given, much shall be required. If all you do is sit in church and you're just a, a, a sponge of everything that the word of God says year after year, but you don't, you know, a sponge doesn't just take in the water, you wring it to let the water come out. If you're just a sponge taking it on, you're just a fat sponge which with a fat head because you have such a fat knowledge of the scripture, but you've done nothing with it to produce results and to produce enduring fruit. You know, Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I chose you so that you can go out and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain, that you can bear lasting fruit. Jesus said in John 15, 8, that by this my Father is much glorified. So this is what brings glory to my Father, Jesus says, when you bear much fruit. So Jesus is saying that God actually takes rounds every year. I believe it's every year because he says for three years I've been coming. So I believe it's like every year there's a, there's a, uh, 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 there's a, not a diagnosis, but there's a, there's a, an examination that takes place. God, he, he, he has his notepad out and he says, what have you done with what I gave you this year? Did you just sit on it? I anointed you to heal the sick. Did you just sit on that and said, oh, I believe I'm anointed to heal the sick, but you actually never stepped out to lay hands on the sick? Did God put a dream in your spirit and in your mind for a of business that would generate multi-millions for the kingdom of God? Because understand, God doesn't just anoint preachers. God doesn't just anoint uh, uh, kings and prophets or whatever. God anoints business people. God anoints teachers. God anoints politicians. There are certain politicians. Daniel wasn't a preacher. He was a politician. But he was anointed one, and he shifted the politics in a positive direction. We need that today. We need people that, you know, there's a lot of people that feel bad because they want to go into government. You shouldn't feel bad for it. Perhaps God's calling you to a position of government so that you can have a positive influence on legislative assemblies and creating laws that are for righteousness, not so that we don't have cesspools of wicked bacteria that, 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 that promote laws such as abortion and, and promoting garbage child education into our schools. We need anointed people in every sector of, of society. We need anointed teachers. So if you think the anointing is just for the, the preacher, just for the apostle, the pastor, the evangelist, teacher, and preacher, then, then you have no idea what the anointing is. The anointing is just the manifest presence of God in a person that quickens their body to think like God, talk like God, and act like God on the earth. We need anointed minds in position of government. We need anointed minds in the church. We need anointed minds in the schools. We need anointed minds everywhere. And so did you just receive an, oh, I feel like on that conference last year, I got the anointing, I feel. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? There's too many people that brag about the anointing. They boast about the anointing they have and they never do anything to actually prove they're anointed in the first place. Not that you have to go out and prove it, but when you're anointing, there will be proofs. I'm not going out and winning souls and laying hands on the sick because I've got something to prove. I'm doing it because God has deposited something in me and the scripture says he goes around looking for fruit from the trees that he has planted. God's planted you for such a time as this. You were born for such a time as this. You're not an accident. You weren't a, a, a cosmological accident. You weren't a big bang accident. You weren't even a, your parents' accident. They may not have planned for you. They may not have, you might have been an oopsie on their behalf, but you were not an oopsie on God's behalf. You were planned. You were born and programmed and destined to be on the earth for such a time as this. You got to think of the billions of people that have been born since the dawn of time and yet God chose to have you come to this green planet for such a time as this. People complain, I wish I was born in the 1500s. I wish I was born. First of all, there weren't active showers back then. Just on a natural level, I'm pretty happy I was born today. We have AC. The average home today, you're living better than kings lived in medieval days. So just on a natural level, I'm glad I was born today. We have television, we have uh, iPads, we have this medium of ministering the word, which is awesome. And so I'm glad I was born now. But on a spiritual level, 
Do you think God made an accident? Oh, I owe for the days of Elijah. You know what Elijah was saying? I can't wait for the Christ to come. You look at Job. Job said, I know my Redeemer lives and he's going to stand on the earth one day. You, you, you know, the level of revelation we have now because of the word and the apostles' writings and the epistles of Paul and our, our full, the full revelation we have of the Old Testament, there was, if there was ever a time to be alive. I mean, you look, we're at the moments of the closing of time. Jesus is about to come back. I mean, everything is set in motion. The third temple has already, which if you think they have to build, it's already prefabricated. All the pieces have been prefabricated. They just got to erect it, which is going to happen when the rapture happens and the Antichrist reveals himself. They're going to pump that up, or at least a little bit before that. But everything's set in motion. The last prophecy, the super sign of the Bible uh, that was prophesied in Isaiah is, and, and also Jesus spoke about it in the Gospels, is the rebirth of national Israel. That happened in May 1948. That was, I mean, before that, anybody that read the scriptures that talk about the rebirth of national Israel from the year 70 until now, because there was the dispersion of the Greeks, nobody thought Israel... It has never, never in the history of the world has a nation that has collapsed and been destroyed ever come back together again. It's never happened. It's never happened, ever. And yet Israel is totally dispersed in the 70 AD. The emperor of Rome marches on in. Israel's dispersed. And then in 1948, in one day, well, it, beginning in the 1800s, the Jews start to come back to the Holy Land. And then in 1948, in one day, they're signed the land of Israel back into their rights. Uh, uh, they've given national sovereignty over that land. And a nation is born in one day, which Isaiah prophesied about. And then ever since then, there's been the Aliyah, the Ascent, the government incentive program where Jews from all around the world have been coming back to Jerusalem. And that, my friend, is a prophecy in Jeremiah, prophecy in Isaiah, prophecy in Ezekiel, that God would put a hook in his people's mouths and bring them right back to the Holy Land. And they'd once again, that we are seeing now. So if you ever need, you know, people say, we don't know the day or the hour. Yeah, we don't know the day or the hour, but we certainly are knowing the season. And this is that season. There's not one sign that has to take place before the rapture happens. It can happen at any time. So we're in the last days. What a time to be alive. We're part of the last generation. We're part of the final generation. We're, I mean, we're part, I'm not saying Jesus is going to come back in my lifetime, but I should probably reverse. I got a little excited there. I'm not saying because no man knows the day or the hour. My belief is that we are in the final generation. We are in the final. We, I, I believe that, I mean, if we see the year 2100, I'll be surprised. That's my belief. Now, I'm not saying go out, take the snippet and say, TJ's date setting. I'm not date setting. That's just my belief. I believe we're in the final generation. I believe we're in the last few seconds of time. And we are, I mean, think of the level of trust God has in our generation. You know, the devil wants us to think that our generation is too far gone, that we're unreachable, and that ultimately, you know, Jesus just come because this group of people are just too hard-headed. When in reality, God's saying, actually, even though the devil has a plan for this generation, I've got a better plan for in the last days, I'm going to pour out of my spirit. There's going to be a mighty revival. There's going to be many that come to the faith. And that's why, I mean, think of it. If Jesus had come back five years ago, many of you watching me right now would be in hell. If Jesus had come back 10 years ago, I'd be in hell. If Jesus had come back six months ago, some of you would have cracked hell wide open. But thank God he's being patient, the Bible says, towards us, not willing that any should perish. So you're not an accident. You were born at the right time for this season, and you weren't born without value or purpose. You're wired. You're wired. The Apple iPhone was wired was wired for a specific purpose, and it's called to accomplish that purpose, and it has the power and the wiring and the technology to do it. When God wired you, he's your manufacturer, not Apple or whatever. Notice how they slap an, uh, an apple on the back of it to, I, to, to, to like brand it. This is our product. Well, you've been branded with the name of Jesus Christ. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit himself, and uh, you've been wired intellectually, intelligently designed for a specific task. And so I'm not talking about the discovery of that. You have to discover that. The plan of God is not to be determined. It's to be discovered. You have to discover that for yourself. But once you discover it, don't make any small plans. And this is what I'm getting to. Don't make small plans. 
I want you to write that in the comment section. No small plans here. Write that in the comment section. No small plans here. No small plans here. Turn with me to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. If you don't have your Bible, just trust me. I'm, I'm reading from the New King James. Psalm 92. This is what the Bible says. But my horn, you have exalted like a wild ox. I've been anointed with fresh oil. My eyes have seen my desire on my enemies, and my ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. The righteous, listen to this. So if you're in Christ Jesus, you're righteous. You're not unrighteous. You're righteous. I don't care what some religious preacher told you. I mean, you know, we're all sinners. You were a sinner. You were saved by grace. Now you're righteous. I mean, it's just, it's very simple. It's 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's one scripture that perfectly describes what I'm saying. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf. He took it on himself. He bore it in his body. That we, being dead to, to sin, might take on, be imputed, receive the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He was made sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you're not a sinner anymore. You've been saved by grace. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's very simple, but it's profound in its application in your mind and in how you walk and talk. So the Bible says, now that you're righteous, here's your portion. Verse 12 of Psalm 92, the righteous will flourish. Not the righteous will disintegrate. Not the righteous will struggle. Not the righteous will, will, uh, will have a hard time in life bearing fruit. The righteous will flourish. How? Like a palm tree. You ever see a palm tree? How their branches extend. It's a beautiful, I love palm trees. I wish I lived in Florida just for palm trees. I wish Montreal had the climate for palm trees because it'd be the best place on earth to live. The Bible says you're going to flourish like a palm tree, meaning your branches are going to extend wide and far. You will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, which connotes supernatural strength. So it's not just God giving you this great vision and God calling you to produce and all that, but God's going to give you strength to actually run the race that is set before you. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord Meaning if you're faithful to God's house, if you're faithful to his kingdom, if you're faithful to his work, if you're faithful to his mission and mandate for your life, you will flourish in the courts of God. They, that, they shall still bear fruit in old age. So there's no expiration to this. There's not, well, you know, he's, TJ's got all that excitement because he's only 29 years old, you know. When he gets to my age, you're going to realize, you know, you don't have the strength to quite operate like that anymore. That's not what the Bible says. It says even in old age, you're still going to bear fruit. They will be, I mean, some people have never read this in, in, in children's church. You grew up, you, you did children's church for 12, 14, 15 years or whatever. You never, they never had this as a memorization verse. But it's in there. They'll bear fruit in old age. They will be fresh and flourishing. It doesn't end. You see the life of Abraham. At 100 years old, God says, you know what? I think it's time. You're going to bear Isaac next year. What do you mean I'm 100 years old? I'm winding down, man. This is like, I, I just, I got my RRSPs and retirement funds pulled out. God said, no, 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 you're actually just getting started. And that's a word for some of you here that are watching me. Because I know we have all ages that watch me. There's some of you, you're 65, 60, 65, 50 and above, whatever. And you've been thinking, I'm going to wind down. I'm going to slow down. I've done what I've had to do. When in reality, God's just been winding you up to get started on what he's actually called you to do. All of that was preparation. Now, God, you're going to see that flourishing. You're going to see that strength. As you've sold your strength in the work of God in your youth, God is going to sow his strength in you in your old age. And even in old age, you're going to be fresh and flourishing. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are yet ahead of you. For you, The Bible says, we that are connected to Christ, we go from glory to glory, from victory to victory, and from strength to strength. And it'll be no different 
covenant for you in Jesus' mighty name. So you see, even in old age, Caleb, I'm 85 years old and I'm as strong today as I was when I was 40. Give me now this mountain that I can fight and contend for. He's 85 years old and he's saying, I want to not only climb this mountain, I'm going to fight for it. And it's not like your local hiking mountain where they got nice paved paths. This was a, a, a raw, natural mountain. There were thorns, there were thistles, there were hard rocks to climb. And he said, I'm 85 and I can climb it. I feel by the spirit right now, many of you that are growing tired and weary. Some of you are 30 years old and you have the body of a 60 year old. You're fatigued. No strength. God is putting his power and his strength, his quickening touch is hitting your body right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you receive that for yourself, just type amen in the chat. So that's uh, Psalm 92. Psalm 1 says that those that meditate on my law day and night, God said, they'll be like a, a tree firmly planted by the rivers of water. And it says they will yield fruit in every single season. Their leaves will never wither. There's no backward motions. If you're sticking with God, there's no back. God's a forward moving God. And so if you're connected with him, you're not moving backwards. It's forward only and forward always. And Psalm 1 says, when you have his word in your heart and you're obedient to it, you'll be like a tree firmly planted by the riverbank that yields fruit in every season. Not in some season. How many of you know I'm in a different season now? In every that's what the scripture says. In every season, his leaves never wither. And whatever he puts his hand to, prospers. That's Psalm 1. So there's a lot of Christians that hate the word prosperity and prosper because a few knuckleheads that abused it. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not a hater of prosperity because the Bible says God delights in the prosperity of his servants. The Bible says as long as Josiah sought the Lord, the Lord made him to prosper in everything he did. The Bible says that uh, in Deuteronomy 28, that the Lord will prosper you when you're coming in and going out. The scripture doesn't speak ill of prosperity. It's a good thing. Why is it wrong? Why is it wrong for a child of God to prosper? I don't understand that, but that's not what I'm getting into today. Isaiah 51. God says this. So some of you, you've never heard of your spiritual heritage, where you've come from. And it's important to know your spiritual heritage because knowing your spiritual heritage will show you what's possible and what your portion is. What your, what your portion is in life. This is God speaking. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Following after righteousness means you're, you're seeking what God is seeking. Your heart is intertwined with God's purpose. You don't have perverted motives. Your eyes are on him, the author and perfecter of your faith. You who seek the Lord, you're seeking what God wants for your life. So you're not doing things for self-gratification or self-promotion or selfish ambition. Like James 3 says, those that are selfish in their ambitions are warped and twisted and they're sinning. We're not talking about selfish ambition. We're talking about seeking the vision of God for your life and then having faith for increase. Operating in these keys for supernatural increase to develop that thing to have an impact on the earth. So you seek the Lord. Everybody, if, if just write, that's me in the comments section. That's me. You who seek the Lord. That's me. So this, you, just, you should read this and say, that's who, I'm, I am whom God is talking about here. I am who God is talking about here. He's not talking about everyone else but me. He's, not ta he's talking about me. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father. Well, that was just for the Jews. In Christ, the Bible says that we, if, if you be Christ. You are Abraham's seed. This is Galatians chapter 3. If you be Christ, if you're in Christ, you are, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I'm Abraham's seed. You know that song we all sang in children's church? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham and I'm one of them. So let's all praise the Lord. Well, that's what he's saying. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. You have Abraham, your father, and Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone. Consider when I called him. He was nothing. He was just another family member in his, in, in his father's house. 
But consider how after I've called him, I blessed him and increased him. And the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He'll make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. So because I'm Abraham's seed, and the Bible says, God said, look to Abraham, consider him, use him as what my blueprint is for you. Use him as a guide as to what I desire to do for you. And he says, how greatly I blessed him and increased him. Increase is the inheritance for every child of God, every born again child of God. Galatians 3.14, the Bible says that the blessing of Abraham what God blessed Abraham with will come upon you through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, how did God bless Abraham? Well, how many of you know Abraham had a hard life? Genesis 24, 1. Abraham was old, so longevity, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So in every measurable metric, Abraham was blessed. The blessing, it overflowed into everything Abraham did. Genesis 24, 35. The Lord has blessed my master greatly. He's become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. So it affected everything Abraham had. Abraham started small. The kingdom of heaven is built on increase. Uh, Mark 4, Jesus tells the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a small seed that once it's sown, the farmer goes to bed at night, he rises by day, the seed sprouts and it grows, it increases. It doesn't stay a seed dead in the ground. We come as we are to God, but we don't stay as we are because this transformative power has effect in us and it it, its effect is supernatural increase. It builds us up. It charges us up to do what God's called us to do. The seed, you know, Jesus tells another parable. He says it's like a mustard seed. It's the smallest, most insignificant seed of all the seeds of the field. And when it is sown, it's so small. But after it begins to develop and grow, it becomes larger than every tree in the field and the birds come and nest in its branches. It becomes a source of life to other creatures. It becomes, God didn't call you to be a burden in your generation. He called you to be a blessing in your generation. God didn't call you to be a liability to those around you. He called you to be an asset to those around you. Look at the prayer of Jabez. Jabez, who is noted in scripture, his prayer as an honorable scripture, an honorable prayer. This is what he said. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. That your hand would be with me. It, it's wrong to ask God to bless you. It's wrong to ask God for increase. Oh, that's such a carnal thing. You know, that's what the religious traditions did. It, it made uh it made increase. It taught that increase was a carnal thing. That desiring growth is carnal. That desiring to, to actually develop something and build something was a carnal thing. Look, if your motives are screwed up, then it can be carnal, yes. But if your motives are pure and right, then you that desire you have for growth and increase is not the devil putting it there. Do you think the devil puts in me a desire to grow this ministry so we can see more people saved? No, it's not the devil doing it. Do you know how many ministers have been deceived into thinking that their small church was what they've been called to? God doesn't call people to small things. God doesn't call people to mediocre things. God doesn't call people. I mean, if your town is 100 people and you have a small church of 80, that's not a small church. You have a massive church. But if you're in a mega city like Montreal or New York and you've been 80 since 1964, there's a problem there. There's a problem. God does not call. You know how many people I know came into Bible college the same year I came in? And they had amazing vision. They would tell everybody, I'm going to do crusades overseas. Oh, I have a vision of seeing millions on an open field. I, I feel called to pastor a church and we're going to impact a city. And we're going to build a building of 1,500 or 2,000 or 4,000 or 5,000. We're going to do all those things. And then year one, they still have that passion. Year two, they're like kind of settling down. Year three. And you're, 
And then you realize they went to a Bible college where the teachers tried ministry, it didn't work out. So they said, well, I like the word, so let me just go out and teach the word. I'm not saying all Bible colleges are like this. There's very good Bible colleges. But I'm saying there are some Bible colleges that the, the prerequisite to being a teacher isn't you've had success elsewhere. The prerequisite to being a teacher is, is you need a job. And that's not right. If you're not qualified to teach on something until you've actually seen that thing happen. Until you've seen that. I mean, you're going to teach the next generation of ministers and you have been a, a total failure in your own ministries. You've never built anything. You've never built a church. And then you go out and tell people, don't go out and think when you go out in ministry that you're just going to grow everything. You're going to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And you're just going to do crusades here and there. Oh, I thought I was like that too when I was young. And then everything just discouraging people. And no wonder now the next generation of ministers are coming out deflated. They had great vision, and then it takes, God's the one that authors great vision. It takes a, 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 a nitwit to come in and beat you into small thinking. And religion makes dull great minds. Don't fall victim to that. Hang around lions, and you'll be a lion yourself. Hang around chickens, and you'll end up in chicken soup. Hang around people. Be followers, the Bible says, of them who through faith and patience obtained, not those who can explain, those who've obtained the promises of God. So if, if increase was a bad thing, why did Jabez pray for his terri territory to be enlarged and then God granting him his request? God would have rebuked him. Oh, Jabez. You carnal thing. How could you ask me to enlarge your territory? You should be content with the territory you have right now. Do you know how many people that don't, in this world that don't even have territory at all? And you're asking for more? You're asking for more? You know, even the territory you have, I'm going to take from you. That's not what God's response was. His response was, you've asked a good thing. God granted his request. Jesus said to him that has him that produces, to him more shall be given. To him that doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away. People think it's the opposite. That when you desire for growth and you desire increase, that God's going to take it away and give it to the one that has none. When in reality, it's the one that has no desire for increase, the one that's just sitting on his blessed assurance, sitting on his anointing. He's the one that God's going to, hey, you've done nothing with it. You've come three years seeking fruit. You've not done anything with it. Jesus told the, the Jewish people, he said, the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken from you and it's going to be given to a nation that's going to bear the fruit thereof. I feel like I was called 15 years ago into the ministry and I'm still waiting for a door to open. 15 years ago, brother, God's moved on. God's moved on. You, I mean, I'm not saying it's hopeless. Perhaps God can reignite that thing in you, but 15 years ago, you got to move. You got to move. And we're going to get into that right now. So here, all that to say, it's not wrong to desire increase. It's actually a godly thing. It's a godly thing. If what you're desiring to do is good for God, it's good for people, and it's good for you, then it's God. If what you're desiring to do, obviously you got to fast and pray for specifics. But if what you're desiring to do is good for God, it's going to win souls. People are going to be impacted positively for the kingdom. It's good for people. People are going to be helped by it, and it's good for you, then, then it's not the devil putting it in you. And you'll, let me tell you one more thing before we get into the five keys I have. You're never going to desire increase if you don't understand the value God has placed on your life. T.L. Osborne writes in his book, The Power of Positive Desire, God believes in you, values you, and esteems you so highly that he created you just a little lower than himself. You can read that in Psalm 8. And then decked your world out with every conceivable treasure, beauty for your health, happiness, success, and fulfillment. You want to know how much God values you? The, 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 uh, the value of an item, when you go to a store, you purchase an item, you realize, I, I didn't really need this, I'm going to go return it. How does the store judge the value of the item that you're returning? They ask you for a receipt because it proves how much you paid for it. If you don't have the receipt, 
then they can just give you whatever the value of it is now. And if it's gone down, if it's diminished in value, they're gonna give you less money than what you paid for, even though you plead and say, no, I, I, I tr trust me, I, I paid more for it. It doesn't matter, it's the receipt that proves what you paid for that item. Well, we have a receipt. The New Testament shows us how much God values us because he didn't send an angel he didn't send money to redeem us. We were not redeemed by perishable items such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, He redeemed us. The blood without spot, without blemish. John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of this world. God didn't send a lower being. God sent His own Son the, the, the second part of the Godhead, to come to the earth and shed his blood for the remission of our sins. You want to know how valuable you are to God? It cost him everything. Everything. Salvation is free, but make no mistake, it cost God everything for you to be redeemed and part of his family. You look at a Jackson Pollock painting, a Claude Moe painting, why is it $4.8 million? Why is it $1.3 million? Why are people paying astronomical amounts of money for that painting? It's not because of the quality of the paint. It's not because the paint itself costs $1.8 million to produce. It's not because uh, the, the canvas on which it was painted is made of gold and diamonds. It's not. It's not because the... Uh, the, uh, the time that it took Jackson Pollock to, to paint that thing is just so time consuming. It took him his entire life. And so it has nothing to do with that. What is the value? Why do people may pay millions of dollars to get these paintings that when you look at, you're so like unamazed. You paid what for that? My six-year-old could have taken a can of paint and dropped it accidentally on a canvas and it would have produced that. That's my, I'm not an art guy, that's just my perspective of it. You paid 1.8 million for that? I could have literally have blindfolded myself, put a can of paint tied by a string from the ceiling, taken a bat and whacked at it like a pinata and I would have done the same, I would have done the same thing that you just did. But anyways, that's not the purpose of the story. What gives the value to the paint, to the painting, to the art? It's because it has that little signature in the far right corner. It's been authenticated that this is indeed an authentic, original Jackson Pollock, Claude Moet painting, and that is what ups its value. You know what God sealed on you? His own name. He gave you his name, and he sealed you with the Holy Spirit. You've been branded with God. You're his very own child. And so you are of immeasurable value to God. Don't let anyone, so if you don't, if you don't carry that sense of dignity because of what, what you mean to God, I'm not talking about walking around like an arrogant jerk and looking down on others. It's by grace you understand that you were nothing, you were reprobate, reprobate, you were dead in sin and dead in trespasses, but God made you into something by his grace. He transformed you. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. You're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen generation. You're God's very own special possession. So quit walking around. I'm eh, not much, you know. You're everything to God. Walk with dignity. So let's go in. Let's go into uh, five keys to supernatural increase. There's certain laws that God has implemented when he created the universe. Certain laws that must be discovered if you're going to enjoy success in life and, and enjoy success in what God's called you to do. And anyone who applies these laws will have success. Doesn't matter if they're a believer or an unbeliever. I'm telling you. Because if an unbeliever begins to learn the laws, that, the principles that are outlined in the book of, of Proverbs and, and other scriptures, and they apply it, even though they're not in covenant with God, they're going to yield pros They're going to yield a, a prosperous life because of it. On the other side, even if a believer is in covenant with God, but does nothing to apply these principles in the scripture, even though they're spiritual and they're born again and they're in covenant with God. They'll not prosper unless they apply it. A believer who is undisciplined and slothful in business principles will not prosper regardless of their spirituality. It doesn't matter how spiritual of a person you are. It doesn't matter how much prayer you give. If you don't apply what I'm about to tell you today, it won't matter. Just like a farmer. You can have a Christian farmer and a, a farmer that is a, a, a non, doesn't, I mean, 
total atheists. And they both go out with one desire. They want to see their field grow with a fresh crop and harvest. The Christian farmer says, I'm just going to believe God for harvest to come. The atheist farmer says, I don't believe in God, but I'm going to apply the laws God has placed on the earth that if I sow, seed time and harvest. Remember Genesis chapter 8, 22. As long as the earth remains, seed time harvest will not be done away with. And the atheist who doesn't even believe God, has no relationship with God, follows the principle of seed time harvest. The Christian is going to be frustrated his entire life. The Christian farmer, even though they're both farmers, even though they both desired increase in their fields, even though this one has a right to, 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 to supernatural increase, the atheist is going to enjoy more increase and more crops than the, the Christian farmer because the Christian farmer simply did not sow. He didn't sow. And remember, Matthew 5.45, Jesus said, God makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He, makes his, he sends rain on the just and the unjust. If a, an unjust person operates in these principles, God, the rain is going to come because he set these laws in motion. There are certain laws that are set in motion. Law number one, if you're going to have faith for increase, you have to take risks. You're going to have to take risks. If you're going to believe God for supernatural increase, the first thing, the first key you're going to have to, to follow is, is you're going to have to take risks. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean risks in the same way the world sees risks. Like, uh, this thing might not work out. I mean... It can be perceived as a risk. What you're doing, your action of faith can be perceived as a risk by others. But you know it's not a risk because God cannot fail. Faith always involves a risk and it's not a risk. Now, I'm, I know the, the word is probably a poor choice of word because faith is not a risk. I always say this. Unbelief is the real risk. Doing what God said is not the risk. Do, not doing what God said is the real risk. But what I mean by risk is that you're going to have to put your... Peter had to step out of the boat onto the water. He had to take the risk that he potentially was going to sink. And he stepped out, and, but he walked on water. Because he was willing to do what nobody else was willing to do in that boat. He got to do what nobody else was ever able, could ever brag that they ever did. Peter was the only one to say, I, only two people have walked on water, Jesus and myself. There was a risk. But understand, when you're stepping out on God's word, there's no risk in the sense that it might not work. It's going to work. In the sight of the world and those around you, it's perceived as risk. Faith, viol tell me, what's the most, the most uh, prevalent urge in mankind? The, most, the strongest urge? It's survival. For, you know, they have that Darwinian theory, survival of the fittest. That's what the world calls it. Faith violates the strongest urge for survival because it provokes you to do something that can be seen by others as high risk. That's why it's easy to not live a life of faith. It's easy to just live in the flesh. Just do whatever you feel like doing. Because your flesh is always going to point you to comfortability. It's always going to point you to the easy road. It takes, it takes an aggressive nature, a... Uh, uh, you can't be passive and operate in faith at the same time. You can't be passive and operate in faith at the same time. Faith is an aggressive force. It reaches, it seizes, and it violates the whole survival urge that mankind has. Because it puts you, it can oftentimes, the action of faith is going to put you in a place of vulnerability as it did with Peter. I mean, look what it did for Noah. Noah, Noah heard from God, there's going to be a flood. Now build an ark. He went out and started building an ark. He took a, a risk in the sense of the word. <clears throat> that he might just be building for nothing. But it wasn't a risk to him. It was a risk to others. People, I'm sure, were mocking. This guy spent all his money on the wood to build that, that ark. What an idiot. Just because of his conspiracy theories that there's going to be a flood coming. 
What a dummy. He could have put that in his 401k. Could have... But Noah took what was a risk to others. It wasn't a risk for him because he saw what they weren't seeing. He saw what they're not, they weren't seeing. That's why many who don't understand faith, they oftentimes will say, brother, you need to use a little wisdom. Because what you're doing is not wise in the eyes of men. Or they'll say, hey, settle down, settle down. You're, you're moving too fast. You're doing this too. They aren't seeing what you're seeing from Scripture, and they've not heard what you've heard from God. And so your action of faith doesn't register with their small minds. It doesn't make sense to them. So they say, settle down. They say, use wisdom. And they might be good-hearted. They might genuinely be concerned with you. But you have to... You have to ignore the naysayers, ignore the doubters, ignore the unbelievers, and stick with God said. And if God said walk on the water, it doesn't matter if you don't have your floaties with you, step out. Step out and do it quickly. There's too many people that hear a command from God and they take their time. They take their sweet time. Well, you know, I just got to get my things in order. Uh, let me, you know what? I'm going to call pastor this and that. I'm going to ask him what he thinks about. Who cares what he thinks? If God told, if you're convinced God spoke to you, who cares? I'm not saying there's not wisdom in the multitude of counselors, but the multitude of counselors aren't a substitute for what God has said. If God spoke to you, go. And you'll get people who, who, who tried something once, didn't work out, and they'll come around you. And they're, they're, because they failed, they're going to start putting worry and doubtful thoughts in you. You know, I tried doing the same thing you did, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's because I miscalculated or whatnot, but, you know, I thought God was speaking to me too. And you don't need that type of speech in your life. You don't need that. Surround yourself with people that are going to say, if God said it, go, do it. People that are going to encourage you. People that are going to motivate you. People that are going to push you in to the path of God. Not pull you away from the path of God. And first of all, he who failed. Even if, like, think of it this way. Even if you go out and attempt great things for God. And, 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 and I'd rather be someone who did, who attempted something great but failed than someone who never did anything or attempted anything in life. I'd rather, especially if you're, you're young, I'd rather have attempted to do something amazing and failed miserably than at 80 years old, sitting on my porch, wondering, I wonder what would have happened if I tried that. I wonder where, where, would I, where I'd be. I'd rather try and fail than having never attempted anything great for God. And it's faith that empowers you to do that. Gideon put his life on the line when he went out with 300 men against an army of like 10,000 or whatever. He, he, that was a risk for Gideon. Gideon. He was bold because he had confirmation from God that this was the right step to take, but it was still a risk. Every, I'm sure there were people that were saying, Gideon, you're crazy. Take the men that are, because he had 30,000 and he narrowed it down to 300. Take the men, they're all available, take them. But he put his life on the line. David challenged Goliath, a kid who had never fought another human, only lions and bears, which that's pretty good too. But he comes up, before a giant who had been a, a warrior from his youth and then starts taunting David. What am I, a dog? I'm going to kill you. David took a risk. He went out and said, no, this day I'm going to cut your head off and feed your... You'll find out. If you'll take the risk of faith, God will sustain you. God will hold you up. God will back up your your bold words. If you're bold enough to say it, God is strong enough to confirm it and perform it in your life. David challenged a giant at 17 years old. Imagine if David had never done that. He would have been a non-entity. Imagine if he had not stepped out. Imagine he had been like every other Israelite in that day. They just heard Goliath mouth off and they just looked around. Well, who's going to do it? 
We need a people on the earth that aren't looking around as who's going to solve that? Who's going to do this? We need born again believers that are going to rise up, hear the voice of God and say, no, I'm called for such a time as this. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not just going to pray about it. I'm going to do something about it. Brother, I believe that I'm called to shake my nation. Uh, I am just waiting for the right time. You're called to shake your nation? then do whatever you can do at the level you're at to start shaking your nation. Even if it's a tiny little tremor, at least start tremor, uh, at least cause a tremor. Don't wait till you have everything. You know, the Bible says, he that regards the clouds and he that looks for the winds will never sow. He's always like, oh, I think it's going to rain today. I'm not going to sow. That's an ecclesiastic, Ecclesiastes. He that regards the clouds and focuses on the winds will never sow. Because he's always worried, maybe it's going to rain today. I, I, I shouldn't go out and start sowing. If you're looking for the perfect conditions, you're going to wait for, there's no perfect conditions. And God, this is the amazing thing about God, is he doesn't need to wait. You you don't have to wait for perfect conditions for him to violently increase you. In the worst of times, in the darkest of nights, God God can bless you and increase you and cause you to flourish. Look at, look at Peter, Luke chapter 5. Master, we've toiled all night and we found nothing. When's the prime time to fish? Not at midday, which that's what, that was the time when Jesus told him to go and let down his nets in the deep. It wasn't midday. No, every fisherman knows you don't fish at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the worst time. It's too hot. The fish are all, they're all hiding. They're in the shade somewhere. When's the right time to fish? From 4 a.m. to like 8 a.m.? They had fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus says, hey, let down your net for a catch. Go out into the deep. Try again. Peter replied, Master, we we just went out in, in optimal conditions. We caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the nets. He took the risk. Faith takes a risk. And when he went out, they caught such an amount of fish that... They had to wave down other boats to come take it all in because their boats were sinking. And then Peter stepped, he, he got on his knees. It was a supernatural thing because immediately Peter recognized this guy is the Christ. This is the Christ. And he never doubted him from that moment onward. Hallelujah. Esther risked everything when she appeared before the king without an appointment. She, she could have been decapitated on the spot. She appeared before the king without an appointment. She, she risked everything. But notice how it's every one of these risk takers that ended up going down in history and we're still speaking of them today. Moses walks before Pharaoh without an appointment and doesn't come with a nice tone. Hey, Pharaoh, let my people go, God said. I mean, if this guy wasn't anointed, he would have been struck down on the spot. But because he was anointed and God said, I'll make you a God to Pharaoh and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. He had a boldness. And he went out. He stepped out. The disciples said, we've left everything and have followed you. They took a risk. And Jesus turned to them and said, yeah, I know you have. And (laughs) rug's about to come out under your feet. No, he said, I tell you the truth. Those who have left brothers and family and lands and properties for my sake and the gospel's sake, they'll receive a hundredfold. All those things that they thought they lost, I'll give it to them. The woman with the issue of blood took a risk in Mark 5. If she was caught outside her place of quarantine with a disease of blood in her in her system, Jewish law says she had to be stoned on the spot. She risked it all to touch the hem of his garment. And what happened? We still read of her today. She's the one that after 12 years, the hemorrhage stopped and she was supernaturally healed. So if you think God's going to lead you to a place where you can reach out and live comfortably without any uh, risk in the human sense of the word or any... Any, any sense that you need his assistance, then you're not ready to live this life that I'm talking about. God is never going to lead you to a place where you absolutely don't have to rely on his assistance and his help. When God installs a vision in your heart, it should make you laugh. Hey, Sarah, this time next year, you're going to have a child. <laughs> God said, did you laugh? She said, no, I didn't laugh. No, but you did. I actually love the New King James. Sake. It says, no, but you did laugh. God said, no, but you did laugh. When Abraham heard it, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. When God speaks something to you, it shouldn't be, yeah, you know what, I think I can get that down. 
with the right amount of resources, if I, you know, I actually know my cousin, he's into this. Yeah, I think we can get that done. It's probably not God speaking. It should make you laugh. <laughs> I remember being in my Bible college, hearing God tell me what I was going to do, and I just, in the spirit, laughed so hard. I laughed so hard. I, I, go, I grew a six-pack of abs in that moment. And that's how I know God, <laughs> it was God and wasn't me. His paths include peace, but his, his paths oftentimes will lead you out of a fleshly comfort. Point number two. Key number two for supernatural increase. Don't, this is important. Don't talk about where you are now. Talk about where you're going. Talk about where you're heading. The temptation, especially when you're starting out, is to complain and say, well, you know, you know, this guy, he did it for two years and he's already at that place. I've been doing it for three years and I'm not that, I'm, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe, you know, I'm, uh, they're just lucky, you know. You start complaining against yourself, against God and against others. And what does it do? Complaining is the, the greatest enemy of destiny. It crushes people. Bitterness, a destroyer of destiny. All it does is it, is it, it generates misery. People start off hit a roadblock and oh you know this always happens to me and they they talk about they get they camp they build a house where they're at they focus at where they're at you know this is how it's always been this is how it's always been how it'll always be and they start to talk about where they're at instead of by faith speaking about where they're where God's taking them that's the 10 Hebrew spies, their problem. That's what their problem was. We spied out the land. We're too small. We don't have strength to do that. We've never fought a, an army like that. Joshua and Caleb said, hey, hey, what are you, shut up. If God's for us, we will by all means take possession. We're moving forward, baby. There ain't a giant tall enough to keep us out. God said you can have the land. We're going to get the land. And there, they had another spirit, and they're the only ones that saw the land. Let, pay special attention to what I'm about to say. The devil doesn't have to move to shut any doors in your life if you're, you just mouth off. People are saying the devil closed this door, the devil closed that. Or they even say, you know, God closed that door. God didn't close that door. God actually had that door open for you. And the door is still open for you because whatever God opens, no man can shut. But your own mouth has shut you off from accessing that door. It's not even the devil. The devil's actually been on vacation. But it's your own mouth. I'll never have that. I can never have that. I can never grow to that. Oh, keep dreaming. You know, people will say that. Believe, if you're in the ministry, believe for a mega ministry that'll have global impact. Not, oh, you know, one can dream, amen. No, not amen. I'm not just dreaming. I've got a word from heaven that he's able to do far more abundantly all that I can ask, think, or imagine according to his glorious power. People's mouths have destroyed more destinies than the devil could ever wish to do. People's mouths have destroyed more destinies than the devil could have ever wished to destroy. Their own mouth, the power of life and death is in the tongue. They that love it shall eat of its fruit. You know what it says? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So not just life. God gave you the power to actually release death. Don't release death on things God's trying to grow in you. Release death on sickness. Release death on, on, on the devil's works. Release death on, on poverty. But focus all your energy on speaking life in what God's called you to do. So instead of complaining that there's no doors open for me, you know, when I started out in the ministry, I could have easily have done that. I had no door, I, I married, living in my parents' basement, no doors open. No, I didn't come from a family of ministries, so it's not like I can pull some strings here and there. I had nothing. Had to believe God, fast and pray for my own meetings. And I had like maybe one or two meetings for the entire year of 20 of 2000 and, uh, 2015, 2000, or it was 2016. I could have easily, and there was temptations to say, you know, no doors opening. Seems like nobody wants to have evangelists in anymore. It 
Seems like the day of holding midweek services are over, you know. I don't... <laughs> if only I can get... If only I can get to that preacher and meet that pastor, maybe things... You know, I could have said all those... I didn't say any of that. My faith was in Christ. If God can't take me there, then may I never go. If God can't open the door, then I don't want it open. If God can't do it, then I don't want it done. And I would fast and pray instead of complaining. And I'll tell you, every time I fasted, without exception, within a week, didn't take more than a week, I had a, a pastor call me, a meeting open, whether it was a youth meeting or uh, just a church meeting or whatever, something opened up without exception. So instead of confessing that nothing ever works for me and doors don't open, do the opposite. Doors are opening for me. That's what I did. Even if other evangelists aren't having doors open for me, God supernaturally opened up great and effective doors for me. Even if church... Analysts are saying the days for revival meetings are done and we're going to just the traditional Sunday morning service. Even Sunday nights are gone. Even when people are saying that, I said the opposite. No, I know, God, that you have hungry people located all around the nations of the world that aren't buying onto that garbage and want to have more services, just like the Word of God says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, but doing so all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. So connect me with them. I know that you have people that are hungry for revival. Connect me with them. I know you have people in your kingdom that are ready to see their city shaking. Connect me with them. And that's what God did. You'll have what you say, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whether good or bad. So choose to speak the good. My business is growing. I may not be where I want to be yet, but I know I'm on a path of perpetual increase. And today is the smallest I'll ever be. That's, that's a word for some of you right now. You thought you were going to die where you're at. Today's just the smallest you'll ever be. From today, your path is going brighter and brighter, even unto that perfect day. Number three, key to supernatural increase. Fasting and prayer is a must if you're going to have supernatural increase. Matthew 9, the Bible says, Jesus said, can the bridegroom... Or the friends of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is still with them. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. In those days, they will fast. That's talking about when Jesus ascends on heaven, on, on high into heaven. That's the day when his disciples are to, to engage in a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. What does fasting and prayer do? Isaiah 58. The Bible says, beginning with verse 6. Is this not the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. So anything that might be tying you down, keeping you from increase. You know, I said it before, God wants you to increase. So if something's standing in your way from being fruitful and multiplying, do you think it's God? Do you think God would say, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, but now I'm going to do everything to prevent you from being fruitful and multiplying? No. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So if there's something that's standing in the way from you being fruitful and multiplying and increasing and flourishing and prospering, then you know that that's not God. And if it's not God then it's either your own lazy attitude or it's the devil. But if you're doing everything right and it's still there's something that's keeping you low, keeping you down, then there's a bond of wickedness. Fasting breaks the bonds of wickedness. It removes the limitations that the devil would seek to lay on you. Is this not the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. Verse 8. Then your light will break forth like the morning. That's talking about breakthrough, supernatural breakthrough. Then your light will break forth like the morning. Fasting causes breakthrough. Jesus returned from his fast in Luke 4.14 and fame of his... Nobody knew who Jesus was before. He goes on a fast, comes back, returns in the power of the Spirit, and then fame spreads. His ministry took off. That's what fasting and prayer does. It was on a fast that Cornelius was asking God. There was something more. He was a, a, a Gentile believer in God, but he wasn't saved, and he was fasting and prayer. And I'm sure he was saying, there's something more. And then while he was on a fast, an angel came and said, hey, Cornelius, send for Peter. He's going to tell you words by which you and your house can be saved. It was fasting and prayer that caused breakthrough, even in the realm of salvation, to the Gentiles. 
Hallelujah. Fasting and prayer. It was a man that was fasting and prayer. Fasting and praying that opened up the door of faith to the Gentiles. Matthew 6 says, when you fast, don't be as the hypocrites. They do it openly to be seen by men. Rather, go into the secret place. Do your fasting and prayer in secret. And that which is done in secret, your heavenly Father will reward you openly. Reward you openly. How does he reward? By growing you. Daniel was given to a life of fasting and prayer. In Daniel 1, he's fasting. In Daniel 9, he's fasting. In Daniel 10, he's fasting. He constantly was fasting. And the Bible says in Daniel 6, 11, that this Daniel distinguished himself because an excellent spirit was found in him. And that's essentially what fasting and prayer does. Not only the spiritual side, that it removes any limitation that's been placed on you, but even in your own, your own self, your own personal development, fasting and prayer... It squashes the appetites of the flesh. That desire to, you know, maybe I won't work today. Maybe I won't. All those non-excellent traits of the flesh are removed when you fast and pray so that the earth, this treasure, the Holy Spirit, the anointing that's been placed in the earthen vessel can manifest and shine forth. That's why Daniel had an excellent spirit. He was given to fasting and prayer. It sharpened his spirit. It, fasting, one of the things it does is it brings your flesh into subjection to your spirit. It brings your fleshly urges into the control of your spirit. So you're not a mess. You've learned to control the strongest urge, which is to eat. So now you can control laziness. No, I'm going to get out of bed today. I'm going to be excellent today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do great today. I'm going to be diligent today. It's what fasting and prayer does. It... it, it it brings your spirit in charge so that you're not a sensual person operating in the flesh. You're a spiritual person. If you can tame the strongest desire of the flesh, which is to eat, then laziness, apathy, all the other enemies of progress will be easy to do. This, you know, Joth, in 2 Chronicles 27, 6, it says, Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. That's what fasting and prayer does. He became mighty because he was prepared. Fasting and prayer prepare, Fasting and prayer prepares you for the growth that God has ahead of you. There's never going to be a convenient time to fast. Well, I'll fast, you know, you're always trying. Just fast. Set a time and fast. There's always going to be a birthday party. There's always going to be a child's birthday party. There's always going to be someone's in, uh, anniversary. There's always going to be a wedding or an engagement or whatever. Make a decision. I'm going to fast. Every month from this day to that day, I'm going to take one day a month of fast. I'm going to make three days a month. Whatever it is, make a decision to set a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. Schedule it into your schedule. Don't just do it when you feel like it because let me tell you, you're never going to feel like it. Nobody wakes up and is like, Man, I feel like fasting today. No. The Bible says Jesus himself was not led by the flesh to fast. He was led by the spirit. So set times into your schedule where you're fasting and, prayer, fasting and praying and stick to it. Stick to it. A. Allen experienced incredible growth in his ministry during a time of fasting and prayer. He was, unsat he was dissatisfied with the results. He wasn't seeing any miracles take place. Nobody was being delivered in his meetings. Demons weren't coming out. And so he goes and fasts and, pray he fasts and prays. He locks himself in his closet and says to his wife, don't unlock it. Don't unlock it. Un uh, until I tell you to. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm staying here until I receive that breakthrough in the Spirit for this ministry. And I don't know how long it was, but during that time, Jesus came and appeared to him, and he gave him 11 secrets on how to grow his ministry. That's one of the things fasting and prayer is going to do that will lead to increase, this supernatural increase that you're looking for. It is a, it'll download into your spirit specific instructions. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. He's a guide. He leads you. And he doesn't lead you into lesser places. He leads you into greater places. It's the Lord your God who teaches you to profit. When you fast and you pray, you've set your spirit antenna in the right place to receive transmission from heaven so that you can do what is necessary for increase. That's what A.A. Allen did. The result, the Lord appeared to him, gave him 11 secrets, 11 keys to implement And he wrote a book called The Cost of the Miracle Working Power of God in which he documents these 11 keys and that led him to have one of the most successful crusade ministries in his day. So what are different types of fasts you can do? Very quickly, you can do a partial fast, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
These are all biblical. Total fast, which is water and liquid. So if you want broths or whatever, you can do a total fast, which is just total abstinence from food, uh, only water and liquids, and that's a full day. You can do one day, two day, three day, seven days, 10 days, however many days you want to do. There's absolute fast. This I don't recommend. This is total dry fast. No water, no liquids. I don't recommend this. Only one person in scripture did this. It was Moses. Jesus did not do an absolute fast. He drank water. We know this because after the 40 days were ended, the Bible says he became hungry. If he had totally abstained of water and food, he would have become thirsty because thirst is that you can't, if you go three days without water, you can die. You go three days without food, you won't, you won't die. And then finally, the last type of fast is water only. I know some of you are thinking, well, what about the Daniel fast? The Daniel fast is not a fast. Uh, if you study the times that Daniel abstained from choice meats and whatever, and it was just vegetable, he wasn't fasting for, uh, in his, he wasn't fasting those things for prayer reasons. He was fasting, Daniel 1, he was fasting because he, the food, the meats had been sacrificed to idols and so it was against the Jewish law to not eat those meats and so he abstained from it. It wasn't a fast in the sense of he was fasting and praying and believing God for increase or whatever. There's one time Daniel fasts, Daniel 11 I believe it is, and that's, that's uh, no food. He doesn't, eat, he doesn't eat any food for 21 days. Anyways, number four, key for supernatural increase, be followers of those who have obtained what you desire to obtain. Find people. You want to increase in the field God's called you to? Find people who are doing what you want to do well. Find people who have, who have, have actually proven to be pathfinders, pace setters, trailblazers in that area. And then learn from them. Read their biographies, autobiographies. Read their books that they've written. You look at my, 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 remember my old studio? I had a library behind me. Now it's over here on my left. I have a bunch of books, a bunch of books from great evangelists and great men of God. Billy Graham, Reinhard Bonnke, John G. Lake, T.L. Osborne, uh, Oral Roberts. I have all kinds of books by these great men of God that I study and I read. I read how I, I look, I mean, look at the today's amazing technology that's available to us. I can literally go and, and watch great evangelists uh, that are in different nations right now and, and watch them preach. And I can learn from them, people that are ahead of me. I can study, you know, what makes their preaching so effective. I, 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 I'm sharpening myself with their, their iron so that I can become better at what God's called me to do. You should have that. If you're a mechanic, study great mechanics. There are great mechanics in history. Study Henry Ford. Study these guys that accelerated and excelled at, at, at what, what they did and what you're endeavoring to do. If you're someone that's into, uh, into landscaping or whatever. If you're into art, find people that are great artists and study, watch their YouTube sessions, whatever it is. Whatever it is. People who don't just explain it. People that have actually proven by yielding fruit. You're a pastor believing God for church growth? Study David Youngie Cho's books. Study Bishop Oyedepo's books. Study these great men of God that had explosive ministries that have the largest churches in the world. And then they're telling you, here's how I did it. Poor men believe in luck. Wise men believe in cause and effect. Poor men say, oh, they're lucky. And they're lucky. They're lucky. Wise men believe. No, there's an effect that I'm seeing. Just like a tree, I can see the fruit. But deep down within, there's roots that they have, they have caught in the ground. And so those books, the secrets of men are in their stories and in their books. Study their books, study their stories to see their secrets. You don't have to learn through mistake, trial and error. That's the stupid way to do things. You can learn by obviously the word, and we're going to get in that in point five, and also by studying men, great men of God that are doing what you want, and not just men of God, great men in the field. That are doing what you're you're uh, you're wanting to do, you know. There's Christian businessmen that have written books. David, you, you want to get out of debt? Dave Ramsey, study his stuff. He'll tell you how to do it instead of just complaining. I, I feel like I'm always 
paycheck to paycheck. It's like I'm taking my paycheck and put it in a shredder. You don't have to stay like that. Dave Ramsey, literally God's drip, dropped wisdom. You don't even have to study every book Dave Ramsey studied to get the wisdom Dave Ramsey has. You can just read his book and you'll, it'll give you the wisdom to get out of debt. A lazy man desires but has nothing. In hard labor, there's profit. Don't just desire. Well, I wish, I wish. If wishes were horses, poor men would ride. It's not about wishing. There's a lot of people who wish. A lazy man desires, Proverbs says, but has nothing. Every pastor wants their church to grow. It's not like there's one pastor and saying, I don't want my church to grow. No, no, no. I, I, don't want it. I don't want people to come. I don't want people to come into this building. I don't want to have souls saved and stuff like that. I mean, that's weird. There's no pastor that thinks that way. Every pastor wishes or desires to have a, an ever-growing church. But why is it that some get it and some others don't? Some have received wisdom from heaven, studied from other men of God that have done it, and they've applied it. And remember, which leads me to point number five. Point number five for keys to supernatural increase is get wisdom. And there's sources of wisdom. There's wisdom from the Holy Spirit. There's wisdom from men that have received wisdom from the Holy Spirit. There's wisdom from books. There's wisdom from the Word of God. There's wisdom from the Spirit of wisdom. So these are great sources of wisdom. But wisdom, its power, its efficacy is not in the knowledge of the wisdom. Well, I know what to do. Great. What are you doing with it? Well, I know, I, I, know, I, I know how to do that. I know how to get that. Really? Wisdom is not effective in its knowledge. Wisdom is effective in its application. Apply it. Proverbs chapter 4. Let's read this. And we're going to close with this. Proverbs chapter 4. And beginning with verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Don't forget. And don't turn away from the words of my mouth. Don't forsake wisdom. And she'll preserve you. Love wisdom. And she'll protect you. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's the main thing. The utmost thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt wisdom. And she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She'll place on your head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory. She will deliver to you. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Proverbs chapter 3. Look, look at what Solomon says about wisdom here. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom. And the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than silver. And her gain than fine gold. She's more precious than rubies. And all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days are in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those that take hold of her, and happy are all that retain her. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. So you want to found anything? You want to build anything? It has to be by wisdom, because even God couldn't build without wisdom. And by understanding, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, the depths were broken up, and the clouds... Drop down the dew. Bishop Boy Deppel tells a story. There was a minister that he looked up to that came back from an America tour, collected offerings, and when he came back, Bishop Boy Deppel walked into his office to meet with him, and he took a bag of cash, and he threw it on the table, and he said, he opened up the zipper, and he said, take whatever you need for your ministry. Bishop Boy Deppel said, sir, with all due respect, he zipped it all up. He said, with all due respect, I'd much rather learn what you know that got the money then take the money itself. Like that old uh, saying, teach a man, give a man a fish, he eats for a meal. Teach a man a fish, he can eat for a lifetime. There's a lot of people that want get rich quick, get increase quick, microwave increase. It doesn't work that way. The Bible actually says that, um, that he that, 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 is gain, that come, has gained hastily will not go unpunished. He that gains hastily. He that has quick, 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 unnatural increase. I'm not saying supernatural increase. I'm saying it's unnatural, meaning it's, it was like a fluke type of increase. And you have a lot of these things on, on YouTube. YouTube's a perfect example of this. You have like, guys, they start up a YouTube channel 
and they have one or two videos that get a million or two million views and they get subscribers, 10, 20,000 subscribers. But then they never produce anything else of value. And so they stay at 10, 20,000 subscribers and they have no engagement and people start unsubscribing because they realize, man, why do I still subscribe to this person? That's overnight success. They rise up quick, but their downfall is quick. The God type of success, God's much more interested in a, a steady path of increase than this overnight hike and then by morning you're, you're, you collapse. And so the wisdom of God teaches you the steps to take in the process of getting that, of, of uh, arriving at where God wants to take you. The Bible says, get wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. Joseph, the Bible says, Pharaoh commended him and said, there's nobody as wise as you. And what happened with Joseph? He was placed second in command in all of Egypt. He was the prime minister of Egypt. Pharaoh said, only, only I will be higher than you. Everyone else, not even a, a dog will bark its mouth without you knowing it. Everything is under your command. His wisdom led him to success. You need, and, and the Holy Spirit, you know, James 1 says that if you lack wisdom, well, I know what God's called me to do. I just, I just don't know what to do. I just don't. If you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he'll give it to you generously. He will not rebuke you for answering, for asking. But let him ask in faith, the Bible says, not doubting. For he that doubts should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. What does it mean to ask in faith? Well, if uh, Proverbs says... That if my heart is wise, God will be happy. That's what it says. If your heart is wise, my heart shall rejoice also. That God rejoices when your heart is wise. Well, if it's going to rejoice God, that means he wants me to have it. And so I know I'm not begging God for wisdom. I just have to say, God, I need your wisdom and I receive your wisdom. Let there be a supernatural installment of your spirit's wisdom. You know what the Holy Spirit is called? The spirit of wisdom and revelation. And that spirit lives in you. Do you know that the Bible says Jesus is the wisdom and power of God? Stop calling yourself stupid. You're not stupid. You have the wisdom of God. Jesus said it this way. The queen of the east will rise with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. As great of a wisdom Solomon had, as, as amazing as his wisdom was, Jesus said, yet yeah, one greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is greater than Solomon. And the Bible says Jesus lives in you. And the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Instead of saying, I'm slow, my mind don't work right, whatever. Say, I've got the mind of Christ. I think the thoughts of God. The Bible says that God has given us his spirit so that we might know the things of God. That we might know the things of God. Philippians says, have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus. Well, did you ever see Jesus backed into a corner and saying, man, disciples, I don't know what we're going to do. Honestly, <laughs> I never thought this day would come, but I'm, I'm baffled. I don't know what to do. No, the Bible even says when they had 5,000 mouths to feed, not counting women and children, he asked Philip, hey, let's feed the people. He said, where are we going to get all the bread? Jesus, the Bible says, he himself knew what he would do. He knew what he would do. He always knew what he would do. He was never taken by surprise. And because the anointing lives in you, you should walk. With that awareness that I can't take an off, I can't be taken off guard. And not only that, God wants to give you blueprints that will lead to what no eye has seen, no, what no ear has heard, what has never entered the heart of man. God wants to make you an innovator in your field. Not just someone that does what everyone else does. No, he's going to distinguish you in your generation. There'll be a distinction on what you do. You'll offer, even in the same service area, you'll offer a service that other people can't provide. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you right now. I feel the anointing strong. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, let there be an outpouring of the spirit of wisdom, those that are watching right now. No matter the field that you've called them to, no matter the, the plan that you've put in their heart, Lord, I pray for supernatural wisdom. The wisdom that the book of Job says 
that they've heard the fame thereof, but they don't know where it comes from. But James says this wisdom comes from above. Not worldly wisdom, not a wisdom that's gained through, through education or a wisdom that's gained through academia, but Father, the wisdom that comes only by your spirit. The Bible says in Isaiah 11 that your wisdom would quicken our understanding. I pray, Lord, those that are watching right now, that their brains, even those that have done drugs, and it seems like their brains are scrambled eggs, unscramble the eggs, quicken their understanding. Give them a supernatural processing ability to receive information, process information, understand information, and apply information from this day onward. In Jesus' name, I feel there's some of you, there are some of you watching right now that you're feeling like electricity in your brain. And God's touching your brain right now. Your IQ is jumping levels. I really strongly believe the Holy Ghost does this to people that are interested in it. Your IQ is jumping levels right now in the name of Jesus. You'll never be lost. You'll always know what to do. Not by might, not by strength, but by His Spirit. Whenever you feel like you don't know what to do, as you pray in the Holy Ghost, exactly what to do will be downloaded into your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The wisdom that is from above is being downloaded into your spirit right now. Hallelujah. The Bible says, may God fill you with all wisdom and understanding that you may know the knowledge of His will, that you may increase in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all might, bearing fruit in every good season. That's what the wisdom of God will do for you. It's what it did for Joseph. Pharaoh commended Joseph. We've never seen anybody as wise as this guy. And what, would, what did Joseph's wisdom do? Joseph's wisdom bailed the known world out of a famine and possibly human extinction. Seven years of famine, would have, if they hadn't prepared for that, Humanity might have been uh, extinct. <laughs> really, God used... The Bible actually says in Genesis 50, God, uh, Joseph says that God, through, through me, saved man. He saved man. Had it not been for the wisdom of God, God will do the same for you. What you'll bring forth will change, will change society. Just like the iPhone did. Just like the internet did. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you're watching right now, you've never given your life to Jesus. You need to do it right now. Maybe you have, but you've fallen astray. You're not living right for the Lord. Maybe you, it was a divorce, loss of a loved one, some relationship, maybe an experience in the church that drew you away from God. God's calling you back today. Come to me, Jesus said. All that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Don't turn away from him. Turn to him. He's your only source of help. David said, I will look to my mountains. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. You maybe have thought that God was against you all your life, and God's always just screwing things up for you, when in reality, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus is for you. He said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. But he can't give you that life unless you connect with him. So join hands with Christ today. Have your sins forgiven. Make sure your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Pray this with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I turn to you. For I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess Jesus is my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Where I was weak, make me strong. Turn my life around. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I'll never be the same again. I'm moving forward today. I'm going to walk on your path of increase. I am righteous because of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would love for you to go on my website, salvationnow.ca. The first link that pops up is I just got saved. Click it, fill it out. And uh, get that information to me. I want to send you something free of charge. A Bible, a book, and some other things. Free of charge. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, go on my website. Do that. And if you have, but you've fallen astray and you're rededicating your life to Christ today, go on my website and do that. I want to get something to you free of charge. Just a way of saying, welcome to the family of God. It's going to greatly help you. Some resources for that. God bless you. For everyone else that's watching right now, if you... Uh, 
you're believing God for increase financially, there's no shortcut around it. The Bible says very clearly, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not be done away with. And they that Paul reiterates it in the New Testament, and he says, if you sow sparingly, if you sow little, so little, you'll reap little. If you sow bountifully, if you sow a sacrifice, sacrificial seed, something that means something that means something to you, then you'll reap bountifully. I can't imagine writing up, and I, I've been true to this since I've said it the first time. I can't imagine writing up a bigger check for a flat screen TV than for the ministry, uh, for someone else's ministry, for, for kingdom work, kingdom advancement work. And the reason why I'm able to write up checks for flat screen TVs or whatever is because if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and even in the area of finances, in your tithes and your offerings, everything else, everything else people have a hard time getting or whatever, it, God just gives it to you. You put God first, you'll never end up last. So you can go to our website. Here are the giving instructions. Salvationnow.ca slash give. You can give via PayPal. E-transfer if you're in Canada alone. Mail. You can send mail to that address. All the, the instructions that you're seeing on the screen are on our website. Salvationnow.ca slash give. You can give via debit. You can give via credit. However uh, you'd like to give. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for giving. Uh, today, we're co-laboring together. We have plans. We have, I mean, I got all kinds of plans um, for, for gospel crusades. We're still believing God for the flights to be opened up again in Canada. We, I still can't get on a plane, which is nuts. And so uh, once that happens, we are going to quickly, quickly, quickly make our way over to a few cities to do... Uh, To, uh, to, to start setting up crusade, outdoor crusade meetings. So if you want to partner in that, it's a great, we're a great ministry to do that. This is good ground. This is fruitful ground. And remember, you can't outgive God. Whatever you give, uh, that guarantees others will hear the gospel. God will give back, pressed down, shaken together, falling over into your lap. That's, what, that's been my story. It's been my story. Someone said, Tamiya Channel, you say something meaningful to me. Do I have to sow money? Nobody has to sow anything. You don't have to give a dime. But if the Lord leads you to give, and if you feel in your spirit to give, and uh, not even that, you, you should be, <laughs> whether you feel like giving or not, you should be a giver. Now, you don't have to give here. You can give wherever the Lord leads you to give, but you should always, you should always be giving to the kingdom of God. In tithes, which is 10%, and in offering. I'm a firm believer in the tithe. People that say, Tithing's not New Testament, brother. Really? Because Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, he rebuked the Pharisees. He said, Woe to you Pharisees and scribes, for you tithe in mint, cumin, and other spices, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice, love, and equity. And then he says, people forget this part. He says, These things you ought to have done without neglecting the latter. So he's saying you should tithe. He's not saying, you know, you guys tithe, but you don't love. It's not about tithing. It's about love. He actually said, you guys tithe, but you shouldn't neglect the other things. You should tithe and love and show justice and show mercy. And then in Hebrews 7, people think, oh, tithing's not in the New Testament. Hebrews 7 is the longest paragraph in Scripture describing the tithe. And it talks about here on earth, men receive tithes. Men receive tithes, but there in heaven, he receives them. That's why when you give, you're not giving to a human organization. You're not giving to a, you're not giving to salvation now. When I give to another ministry, I'm not giving to another ministry. I'm giving to God. I'm giving to God. That's why whether the ministry flops or flourishes, whether the ministry, the guy has moral failure or not, I don't care. It's not like, oh, was my money in vain? No. Because I gave to God. I'm not giving to, to a man. I'm not giving to be noticed by a man. I'm giving to the Lord. That's right, Alicia. Helicopter for TJ. Matter of fact, let's just go all the way. We need, <laughs> we need an airplane. I know people don't like when preachers have airplanes, but you know what? In the last two years, I would have loved an airplane because the only way I can get on a plane right now is if I own my own jet. So it's no longer should preachers have jets. It's If a preacher has an itinerary, 
that he can't fly commercial. And I mean, even now, forget if he can't fly. I can't even fly commercial if I wanted to. They won't let me on a plane. They won't let me on a plane. Kay said, hey, can you please quickly mention the fifth point? It's wisdom. And you can go back in the broadcast once I, I stop streaming and uh, you, can, you can check it out there. But yeah, the fifth point was with him. Hey, Dennis, God bless you, my friend. I have the mind of Christ. That's right. All right. I love you all. Once again, giving instructions. If you would love to give, salvationnow.ca slash give, PayPal, Salvation Now, e-transfer for Canadian givers only. And then you can give by snail mail. Also, before I forget, whoops, that's not good. But anyways, Montreal, um, this Friday, May 27th, I'm going to be in, Mon I'm in Montreal, but I'm going to be preaching at the Remnant a young adult group at Good News Chapel. So I'd encourage you to join me. I'm going to post that on my Instagram tomorrow. So that's Montreal, May 27th, 7.30 p.m. Friday, 7.30 p.m. Hopefully you can join me there. Uh, love to see you. All right, God bless you all. I love you. Thank you for spending an hour and 51 minutes with me uh, on your weekday. I really appreciate that. I pray that it was a blessing. If you haven't shared it yet, please share it. Uh, Shabara just said, where do we give and what's your website? It's salvationnow.ca. Salvationnow.ca slash give. I posted it right there. Thank you, Shamara, for, for giving. For everyone else that's giving, God bless you. I love you. I'll see you Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, unless Jesus comes back. In that case, I'll see you in the clouds. But until then, God bless you.